Hey, good evening, everybody. This is Jeff from Junior Hockey Advisor. I hope you're having a great night. Uh, what a fantastic weekend for sports. Hockey, uh, you know, if you're not a basketball fan, uh, you're probably like me. Maybe you're a basketball fan just this time of year. I love uh, the, uh, the the March Madness. I love the Final Four, the Elite Eight, Sweet 16, especially when my Michigan Wolverines are, uh, are doing so well, which, by the way, uh, they've in the last eight years, they've had more Elite Eight appearances than any other team in the nation. So uh, let's hope we can put it away this time. Anyway, enough basketball talk. I'm excited. Tonight, we're going to do a lot of things. You, you know, you always surprise me. I look down at my, my uh, clicker right before I go on uh, you know, with the live stream, and uh, I'm one or two minutes out, and the number's like three people, and two of my relatives. And I look at it and I go, oh, no, nobody's going to watch that. And then all of a sudden, boom, 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 the number starts ticking up. And I appreciate it. We're going to have a great night tonight. If you have questions, we will get to them. We will get to your questions. But tonight's special. I tried something different. You know, we've got a lot of uh, equipment here. And I've got a lot of, you know, I've spent a lifetime in ranks. I've spent a, li a lifetime. Uh, let me back up. I'm Jeff Colson. Uh, I'm the junior hockey advisor. I've uh, been doing this for over 35 years. I've been a head coach. I've been an NCAA coach. Uh, I've been a owner, a general manager. I've been a scout. Uh, and I've literally been you know, all over North America with hockey for 35 years. Uh, and I want to share with you as much as I can about the process of moving up, the process of being uh, – <laughs> there's no other way to say it, to, to escalate yourself to the next level. What does it take? How do you get there? You know, we all know about talent. We all know about hard work. We all know about cliche things. And when I say cliche, we'll talk about that a little bit tonight, too. I'm going to write that word down because it's important. But, you know, tonight we're going to start off with, I want to show you a video I put together with the help of my wife. My, I, I talked my wife into doing the voiceover because I figured everybody's sick of hearing my voice. And I picked the 10, excuse me, the top eight, the top eight ranks that are, are my list of bucket list ranks for anybody in hockey. Uh, now, you're going to see you know, that there's some bias in this list, and, and I'll explain the bias a little bit later. Uh, you're going to see you know, what, what I favor. I favor history. I favor iconic history in my choices. But I also I, I, I love to, to explore new areas and explore new things, and there's at least one on the, on the list that I think you'll find unique and different. Now, there are fantastic rinks everywhere. You know, I, I said in the clues to this that Minnesota didn't make the cut for my top eight. It's not because Minnesota doesn't have great rinks. Minnesota may have the most great rinks out of any state out there. But I was talking about iconic rinks, rinks that have something that is extremely rare, uh, that means something significantly to the history of the game, uh, or, or just something so unique that they needed to be put on the list. So I want to debut that list for you. I want to go through this. Bear with me. I hope you enjoy it. It's only about eight or nine minutes, so it's not long. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, put your comments up while it's going on. If you could, uh, if you like what you're seeing, or if you have any comments about what's going on, uh, I would love, I'd love to hear your comments. And don't forget, we will get to our questions tonight. But I want to do this first. Let's have a little bit of fun with this and see what you think. Cambridge, Ontario. A short drive from Toronto or Buffalo, this rink is accessible from Detroit if traveling for hockey to Toronto. The Galt Ice Garden was built in 1922 and is the oldest continuously running rink in Ontario. While plenty of great hockey players have come from this area, this rink is where the first women's hockey team began, the Rivulets. It's also where Gordy Howe played junior hockey. The mural on the wall and the painting of Gordy Howe are a highlight of this stop. The Galt is a great add-on to a visit to the Hockey Hall of Fame or a weekend of watching some exciting junior hockey. If visiting in the summer, Cambridge is not too far from some summer theater and great food at Niagara-on-the-Lake. Number seven, Ingalls Arena. New Haven, Connecticut. 
The Yale Whale is the home of both the men's and women's Yale hockey teams. This unique design was built in 1953 by Iro Saarinen. His objective was to capture the fluidity and grace of hockey and to attract the student body to a rink that was outside of the main campus. A great day trip for any East Coasters or those visiting New York City or Boston. Make sure to spend time exploring the campus, catch a game, and visit some of the old restaurants next to the main campus where there are plenty of great old pictures to see. Oh, and don't forget to find the areas where Indiana Jones was filmed. You gotta get out of the library! Number six, Matthews Arena, Boston, Massachusetts. Continuing on our East Coast swing, we travel to the heart of Boston. Get ready for some great hockey history. Matthews Arena opened in 1910 and was the original home of the Boston Bruins. It is the only home of an original six team that still exists. Hey, even the Boston Celtics called this place home for about a decade. Currently, Matthews Arena is the home of the Northeastern Huskies men's and women's teams. Unfortunately, Matthews can't claim the title of oldest continuously used rink in North America. The facility burned in 1918 and was reopened in 1921. During that time, they played on an outdoor rink. Number five, Canmore Recreation Area. A swing out to Alberta may give us the most unique experience on the list. Accessible from either Calgary or Edmonton, Canmore may be the most beautiful venue in junior hockey. Canmore is the home of the Eagles of the AJHL, and you will have access to some unforgettable sights. How about a herd of elk right outside the rink? Take a couple of hours to drive into the foothills and you can find the wild horses of Alberta. Number four, D Stadium, Houghton, Michigan, the birthplace of professional hockey. The D houses a small museum that traces the roots of the professional game. The D is the seventh oldest rink in the world. It first opened in 1902 and the first game in the facility drew over 5,000 fans. This was particularly extraordinary because the total population of the area was less than 9,000. Houghton is the home of Michigan Tech. In fact, the D was their home rank until the early 1970s. There's plenty to see in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. After the D and Michigan Tech, drive up to Calumet to see the Calumet Arena. It was recently recognized by the NHL and Kraft and actually hosted an NHL game. It is the oldest continuously operating rink in North America. You might also visit the other two NCAA Division I programs in the Upper Peninsula while you're there, Northern Michigan and Lake Superior State. Make sure to try a local dish that originated with the copper miners called a pasty. Similar to a pot pie, it's best served with gravy or ketchup. Number three. Georgia's Pond, Shreveport, Louisiana. Get ready for a totally unique experience in Shreveport, Louisiana. Located a couple of hours east of Dallas, Georgia's Pond is the home of the Shreveport Mudbugs of the North American Hockey League. The Mudbugs had a prior life as a professional team. However, the locals have embraced junior hockey to the fullest. The crowd is big, enthusiastic, and well-informed on the game of hockey. Make sure to buy your plastic mud bug to toss onto the ice when the mud bugs score. Pre-game at Bojack's, and you will see fans tailgating here. You will also get a chance to sample local gumbo, jambalaya, red beans and rice, and a bucket of, well, crawfish, of course. As mud bug fans say, claws up. Number two, Cambria War Memorial, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Cambria has many beautiful jewels of the history to share. It is an active military memorial with a small military museum that is open during the Tomahawks games. Get here early to visit the museum and stroll the arena.
for other military displays. The Tomahawks draw a large, loyal crowd, but if you feel like you've been here before, or if things just seem a little too familiar, it might be because they are. <laughs> This is the home of the most iconic film in hockey, Slapshot. Yes, the press box is still here. Yes, the game clocks are original. There is a small Slapshot museum located near the Zamboni entrance that is also fun to visit. Keep an eye out for the Hanson brothers. One of them tends to watch home games often. Stop in pre and post game at Scott by Dam just across the street from the rink to get the full local experience. Number one, Herb Brooks Arena, Lake Placid, New York. This is a great visit, either summer or winter. This arena is the legendary home of the Miracle on Ice. The 1980 gold medal game was played here. However, the complex is actually made up of several rinks, including the original rink from the 1932 Olympics. The tour of the facility includes being able to sit in the stands while the recorded voice of Al Michaels asks the hockey world, left in the game. It's over. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Unbelievable! Make sure to stop into the museum while at the arena. You can see the iconic sport coat that Herb Brooks wore along with many other memorable items. While in Lake Placid, stop in across the street to ice skate on the outdoor speed skating rink. Stroll the downtown area and take in this nostalgia along with breathtaking views of the mountains and Mirror Lake. If you're visiting in the summer, barbecue is on the menu. Just outside of the town is the Tale of the Pup. Live music, great food, and a 1950s vibe all cap off a perfect tour to our number one pick. We hope you enjoyed our eight choices for iconic rinks across North America. Happy travels! Wait! All right, so that's my list. I want to go through a couple because I've got a lot of attachment to some of these places, and um, I thought I'd share it with you. Uh, yeah, great job, Greta. Greta just read a piece of paper. Who do you think did all the editing, cutting, cutting and producing and getting all the things together? You can't give Greta all the credit on this. I mean, she did a good job. She did a really good job, but it should be great job. Jeff, a little bit Greta. Okay, let's let's put this into perspective. No, I, I thank my wife because I tried to read that. It, you know, I can talk like this all night long. You give me a script and you try to get me to read off a script like that, and it sounds so fake and corny. Um, anyway, thanks for uh, thanks for dealing with uh, my silliness on putting that list together. But I, I thought it was important. You know, I, I I've been to all these just iconic rinks, you know, all over the place. And there's some attachment. I want to get to that because there's some really cool attachment with my family in these places. Um, and we've got a contest winner that I'll have to uh, decipher. We, we had the, all the platforms and people were, were putting it on different threads. And uh, I thought it would combine into one thread where I could just be able to pick it out. But I've got to go back and just double check. Uh, but i got to be honest with you. I think I stumped a lot of people. Uh, I... I, I I, I don't think there was many more than maybe two or three uh, of the same an or the correct answers on anybody's guesses. So uh, it's going to be tough to figure out who it is, though. But, you know, I think maybe somebody had said the Galt, you know, which is uh, up in Cambridge. Uh, I know I did say see the whale. Uh, a lot of people said Matthews Arena in Boston. It should be. That's one of the uh, the oldest drinks around, and it's got a great history. Uh, nobody said Canmore. Nobody picked uh, anybody in the – well, somebody picked Brooks out in the AJHL, but uh, nobody picked Canmore. And I picked Canmore because, once again, it's the experience. That video of the elk herd is actually a, f a, a video that my son sent me off his phone during team warm-ups 
Uh, they were playing there in September, October. Uh, this is probably two or three seasons ago. And uh, that was during their team warm-up. They walked right outside, and there's a, a herd of elk on the soccer field right next to the uh, rec center. So um, D Stadium, for those that, that, uh, that, that uh, know the Upper Peninsula, that's uh, right, right in Houghton, right downtown Houghton, right on the water. Uh, it, it's not far from Cambria. Many of you that are NHL fans uh, know the Craft Arena. Uh, uh, Cambria right up the street, one of the oldest rinks around. But the D's got a lot of history, and that's because it was one of the first. Now, I'm going to get into a little bit of that and have some fun with the history. But I want to, uh, you know, I don't really talk about my family much uh, when I do this, but I, I wanted to kind of tie it in a little bit to give you an idea of some things. Uh, that's my daughter, uh, and that's uh, after her first year of college, she decided that uh, she was going to transfer colleges. So she went back and she played for the Rivulets in Canada. She spent a year up with the Rivulets. Uh, and that's after winning a national title as a as a college player, and then she went on to uh, go to Michigan, and then on to uh, Penn State Law. But that's her when she was playing for the Rivulets. So she actually had a year a, a year with the most uh, you know storied women's franchise in uh, women's hockey, uh, women's or uh, junior youth, junior or women's hockey. It's uh, the Rivulets are that's where it all started. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I wanted to share with you this. This is my wife. Uh, two weeks ago, in in uh, in our first visit ever uh, to Shreveport, and this was us. They had a uh, a uh, pets night where you could bring your pet to the rink. So that was us sitting uh, in Shreveport watching the game. And I've been to most of the rinks in the uh, North American Hockey League, and had never been to Shreveport. Now Shreveport didn't make it because of the facility itself, which is awesome. It made it because of the people and the experience. It's Shreveport, and you know they do things like. You know, throw these little things. This is my little rubber uh, uh, mud bug. They throw them on the ice. And so we've got ours that we kept from the experience. And uh, I thought you'd enjoy seeing that. And uh, this is a picture of, uh, if I can get it to work here. That's my son in Shreveport uh, with my daughter and his girlfriend. And then uh, finally... Another picture, the reason we, we know Johnstown so well is because you know, I had a chance to, to watch my son in Johnstown too. So uh, once again, you know, I don't usually get into much about my family, but there's a lot of ties there. Now, I'm going to share with you probably the most uh, interesting tie to the whole area. And if I can do this, I will uh, pull this up for you right now. This is the screen share. And, oh, I did. I did uh, somebody asked me to actually post somebody into the uh, group, and I did that while we were on uh, – I was watching this video, but I want to share with you. I hope you can see this. This is D Arena, and this is my son and I up at D Arena, and this was a couple of years ago. He was up for a college visit. But what I want to do is I want to slide through this a little bit because it's just more than a visit. Um, this is actually Houghton. That on a, the arrow points to Michigan Tech. That's the Michigan Tech Arena. You're looking down from the sky there. Now. If you continue across, right across the rink there, there's a road there. You can see where my little uh, arrow is. And then you see where the end of the arrow is, that where the red ends right there. That's a, that's a, this is a, a graveyard right out in front of the uh, Michigan Tech Arena, literally right across the street. That, that's a cemetery. That arrow right there where I'm pointing is the Erickson uh, plot. That's the family plot. Uh, my son's great great grandfather is named Erickson. And why is that significant? Well, we're going to get to that because you know, that's just a little bit about the. And I'm trying to get to this a little video, uh, trying to get through it. And you've already seen that. You've already seen that. Uh, is Ed Erickson? He was one of the first professional hockey players. Uh, in fact, he was part of the whole first professional hockey uh, uh, era. And this is also a picture of him as a, uh, a player and a general manager. You can see up in the top left where he was a general manager. And you can also see uh, over here was a player. So uh, the hockey roots run deep. This league is actually part of the, uh, the IHL now, the International Hockey League. And there's the actual uh, family burial plot. And once again, there's how close it is to the rink. So I thought I'd share that with you. And there's another picture of him from earlier, much, much earlier. Uh, I'm one of the younger teams. So anyway, I thought I'd share that with you. Uh, I, now, if I can just get back to my normal screen here, bear with me. 
I normally don't jump around like this. So, all right, what'd you think? Was that worth it? Uh, did you guys uh, did you guys pick up anything? Uh, I know that uh, all these rinks, you know, like I said, the golf has a meaning to me. Uh, the, the whale and the Matthews only because uh, my kids were were uh, recruited or, or were given a scholarship to go visit or, and went to visit the school when they were given a scholarship. Uh, Camrose, you know, my son was there. D, uh, George's Pond, Johnstown, and then Lake Placid, you know, is a working with USA Hockey and running, uh, you know, events or, or being part of the USA Hockey events. I had a chance to do a lot of things and uh, probably the most uh, just chilling uh, event was actually living in the uh, Olympic uh, a village where the uh, where team U, team USA and all the Olympic athletes uh, lived. When you work for USA Hockey and they do Lake Placid events, which they don't do as many things in Lake Placid as they used to. It's not a, uh, it's not, I guess it's not cool anymore. <laughs> I guess I don't know, but uh, Lake Placid doesn't get as many events as they used to. But when they used to get the events, um, the athletes and the coaches would stay in the Olympic vi village. And then you'd ride the bus over from the Olympic Village to uh, the rinks. The you know the the three ice rinks are all part of the uh, you know where Herb Brooks Arena is at is actually in the middle of two other rinks: the really old one and then the the practice one that's uh, to the left. So what's interesting about it though is uh, you can be on the ice uh, doing uh, skills work with the uh, with the national level athletes. So you know U15, U18, whatever you're working with. And uh, yeah, I was fortunate; I had a chance to get out there with. You know, going back into the early 90s and into the 2000s, I got a chance to work with a lot of great athletes. So the interesting thing about it, though, is, is they'd be giving tours while you're on the ice in Lake Placid. And you would have these tour groups going through it, and you would, all of a sudden, you know, they'd be talking, and you're not really paying attention to it because you can't really hear them until they turn on the speakers and they do the, you know, do you believe in miracles? They play the last few minutes of the game, and uh, you're on the ice, and you're hearing the crowd, and you're hearing Al Michaels, and you're you're watching these you know fans up in the stands look down at you, and wait, well, that looking really at me or the you know they they're kind of looking at the hockey players, but they're listening to this Al Michaels call, and literally, you know, every coach on the ice. I don't care if you're Scotty Bowman. I don't care who you are. Uh, maybe it's not Scotty. Wouldn't get as as excited as an American coach would, but you you get the point. It doesn't matter who you are. It's going to send chills down your spine. And it, it, it did, you know, the first time I heard it, it did the 30th time I heard it. Uh, and it's it's a really, really cool experience. So, it, you know, can I pick out one? Uh, you know, somebody just texted me a second ago and said, can I can I pick out my favorite out of that group of rinks? Um, no, <laughs> no, I can't. I can tell you the most surprising rink was D Stadium because of the, the deep family roots. Uh, going up to, to D with my son and actually having him see the pictures of his relatives on the wall in the museum and seeing his great great grandfather you know as a as a you know professional hockey coach and a general manager and a player that was kind of cool that was probably the one that uh that's the coolest of them all um but you know if you if you go to johnstown and get a chance to go to johnstown uh, the biggest thing to do is take the time to talk to some people um when you walk in Turn to the right, go down three entrances, and talk to the usher. Talk to the usher. He's probably in his early 60s now. You just He'll be standing there smiling. He's shaking hands. He's still got his 70s feathered haircut. And you're going to enjoy the conversation because he'll point to exact things and exact places in the rink. And he'll give you three or four minutes of a tour that is worth $50. You know, it literally is... Uh, a, a two or three minutes where you could not get if you uh, if you tried uh, through videos or just walking around yourself. So uh, you know, take advantage of it. These places are all accessible you know, to pretty much everybody: East Coast, Midwest, West Coast, and uh, and I really enjoyed them across the board. So that's all with that. I'll post the winner, and I, I hope that you enjoyed it. Didn't see too many comments coming in, so maybe it was boring. I don't know. I enjoyed it, you know, and I hope uh, I hope you learned something about at least one rink. You know, put it in the comments. Let me know. If you don't agree with the list, you know, let me know. If you, you saw a rink that you liked and you didn't know anything about, throw it in the comments. Let's hear about it a little bit. I'd love to hear what your comments are about these rinks. Uh, I, I find them so interesting, but maybe uh, you do or don't. Tell me about them. So let's let's get back to some questions. Let's get back to uh, what's going on. Hey, no, uh, I didn't check today because I was working on this, but, uh, you know, you know there's, there's some rumblings going on up in uh, – 
the BCHL, the British Columbia Hockey League. Uh, but you notice that the, uh, the AJHL, Alberta, which is the province right next to them, came out, and they're both strong leagues. They're, very, they're both very strong leagues. And uh, the AJHL came right out and said, hey, look, you know, we're happy, we're staying, and none of our members are leaving. So, you know, that was interesting that they came out. So it's definitely more than just rumor when one league uh, comes out and puts out a press release it, it, to make a statement like that. So uh, as soon as some more information comes out and uh, if anything's happened in the last few hours that anybody knows about, uh, please you know, toss it to me. Let me know. I'd be glad to you know, post it and then make some conversation about it. Uh, besides that, let's, uh, let's take some questions here. Uh, oh, here's a comment. I think someone was very hungry uh, when they made the video. Yeah, yeah, look at me. I'm always hungry. You, know, you can't get away from that. But I can tell you this. Um, when we travel, I try to smell the roses when we go to places. When my kids go to places, when my wife and I go to places. Uh, for example, we drove to Shreveport from, from Pittsburgh, New York. And we did it on purpose. We have two dogs. My daughter flew in, uh, Adam's girlfriend flew in, but we drove him, so we took some time. And we went through Memphis, and we went through uh, and saw everything you'd see in Memphis. We went to, to Clinton's uh, birthplace in Hope, uh, Arkansas, and we actually took time to do things while we were in Shreveport, too. And, you know, that's the one thing I've learned in my time in hockey is, you know, boy, oh, boy, you know, if you're a travel hockey family, you get a chance to go to Detroit. You get a chance to go to Boston. You get a chance to go to Toronto. You know, who else knows where you're going besides that? You're going to Kansas City sometimes. You're going to St. Louis. You're going to, you know, all, all places all over the world, literally now. <laughs> but North America, definitely. But, you know, now you've got tournaments in Russia and Sweden. And you know, things are, you know, things are so incredibly fun for kids because they get to go to these places. But you know what? carving out some time to go see something while you're there is something that I've really tried to do with my kids uh, from day one. And uh, I think that's really important, and I, I try to do it. I, I, everybody's got their own thing, that, and they say, hey, look, we're here to focus on sports. I get that. You know, a lot of families take that approach of just wanting to focus on sports, but it doesn't mean you can't get to a museum. It doesn't mean you can't get to a certain, you know, you know landmark, uh, you know, something. If you're playing down near New York City, you know, getting the times well, – Pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, getting to places like uh, like uh, Times Square or getting to the you know see the uh, you know the, anything you know the, the Statue of Liberty. I don't care what it is, you know, but doing something so that it makes it memorable. So anyway, hey, look, uh, glad to see some of the things. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate the comment again. Uh, enjoyed the video. Uh, we do the food thing when we travel. It's about fifty percent of the reason to go any place. I fully agree. We once went to Sandwich in England for a sandwich. That's my kind of trip. That's my kind of trip. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, maybe I will get to a list of the worst drinks, too. Uh, and I see somebody else uh, has got a few suggestions on there. Uh, yeah, worst drinks would be a lot harder to do. The list is a lot longer. So, all right, let's see if we can get some serious questions here. Um, let's get back to my list here. And it says, uh, okay, here we go. We're in the Philly area. Any thoughts on the NHL Combines, father of an 06? Okay, so there's been a lot of conversation. Uh, there's been some conversation on our, our junior hockey advisor uh, discussion group about the 06s, about uh, the, the null Combines. But let's just talk about uh, 06s in general. Okay, so the year right now that's the prime or, or the, the senior year in junior hockey is the 2000s. So that, that means next year, the senior class is the O1s. That means O1s are on their way out next season, just like the 2000s are this year. That means the O2s and the O3s are going to make up the heart of uh, junior hockey, especially the North American Hockey League. You'll see O1s, O2s, O3s. And it's going to be in that order. The North American Hockey League tends to be the oldest league. It's not getting older because it's already been the oldest and it's held that title for quite a while. Uh, so you'll see next year, 01s, 02s, and some 03s. Just like this year, there's 2000s, there's 01s, and there's 02s, but 02s don't play as big of a role. There are very few 03s, there are very few 04s in the league, which means next year there's going to be very few 04s and 05s in the league. So if there is very few 04s and 05s in the league, there's an 06 for the North American Hockey League, 
you're doing a few things if you go to any of the combines, any of the showcases, or any of the main camps. You're there to impress. You're not there to make a team. Uh, you're there to get the experience, to get the nerves out of the way, so that as you progress over the next few years, you're used to it. In other words, uh, if you're in 05 or in 06 and you get invited to go to a, 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 a pre-draft, a draft skate, you get to go to any of the, uh, the combine events, um, you're there for one purpose and one purpose only. You know, get a, I shouldn't say one purpose only. You're there for multiple reasons, but you're not there to make the team. Okay, you're there, possibly if you're still looking for a home, uh, they, they might offer you a spot in their U18 program if they've got a, a strong affiliation with the U18 team. Now, the thing to be careful of here is a couple things. Um, there, was, there was some banter about, about, um, about the whole tender process today too. We'll get, I'm going to set the tender process aside because and I'm writing tender down so I don't forget it. Um, Tenders are a different issue with the null, uh, but let's get back to this combine issue. If you are in 02, 03, and possibly in 04, combines become a little bit more serious. However, you know, combines, pre-draft skates, uh, first look camps, whatever they're called, and everybody calls them a little bit differently, uh, different things a little bit differently, all of these things are designed to get you exposed and to get you on a list and to get you, you know, where you're continually in the loop of that program. Uh, is it a moneymaker? Yes, it is a moneymaker. Yes, these teams do it for a profit. Yes, there are going to be kids there that have no shot of ever making a team. But if you're honest about your talent level and you understand what your talent level is and you truly believe that you are bound to that level of hockey, and if you're North American Hockey League material, that means that you should still be, you're, you're in the window of being, uh, at that age, being that young. If you think you're North American Hockey League material, you you know, still have a little bit of bandwidth towards the USHL. You have bandwidth towards the BCHL, the AJHL, uh, the NCDC, and there's a lot of other leagues that would fall into play there, um, of which the majority of them are not going to be looking at 06s and 05s, Okay. Now, your younger leagues, and we'll do a, we, we've done a ton of this on the USHL, uh, and I've got videos up there about you know the, the drafts and how the USHL drafts are. You can go to my YouTube, Junior Hockey Advisor, on that and grab some of those videos. But I would not get too bent out of shape about um, making a team. Absolutely go. The more lists you're on, the more invites you get, uh, then it's just a matter of you and, and your family having responsible choices. How much can you afford? How much energy can you expend? How much family time can you, you, you know, pull out of the reserves for this? Can you combine it with, with uh, other vacation time? Can you do other things along with this? As long as you're not burning yourself out, as, not as, as long as you're not breaking the bank, you're hurting nobody to attend these events and to, to, to get used to the process. Because that's really what this is all about. Because there'll be skaters out there, and they're usually skaters uh, in combines that are a year or two older than you, um, or three years older than you. Sometimes they'll have actual veteran players out there. And you can get an idea of what they, what they see. You get a chance to talk to coaches, talk to other parents. These are great events as long as you're there to actually absorb. you got to be a sponge. You've got to be taking all this information across the board. And it's designed, you know, I, I look at this as being custom designed for you, the parent, and the player to take advantage of. People say, oh, the teams are taking advantage of you. I say just the opposite. You get to take advantage of them. You get to suck them dry of all their information. You have no commitment to them whatsoever at this point. So you can find out, are they organized or are they not organized? Do they run good drills or they don't want to run good drills? Is their rink clean? Do they look like they care? Are they professional? What do their coaches look like? How do they present themselves? Is a coach walking around with, you know, with his shirt untucked, his hat on backwards, you know, four days of growth in his beard and, and uh, just basically looks like he rolled out of bed? Or is the coach the first one there with a clipboard in his hand, you know, ready to go for the day and, and looking professional and talking and greeting people with a professional manner? The general manager, the owner, whoever they are, you get a chance to read all this stuff. You get a chance to get to know about all this stuff and ask questions. So I, I think these are great things. I think that you should take advantage of these as much as, as possible. Um, as an 06, though, um, just keep it in perspective. You know, this is not going to be your year and any promises to go to, you know, to get involved with their NA3HL franchise 
remember, leagues of destination and leagues of advancement. Okay, an NA3HL uh, team and the, the chance to advance from there to a North American Hockey League team is minimal. And the only thing you have to do is go. Now, you, you, granted, each one of those teams gets to uh, have a player tendered and they get one player drafted off those teams every year. Look at how many kids actually make it that were drafted or tendered. And the number is usually less than 10 in the league. You know, think about that. Of all the NA3HL teams, there's usually less than 10 that actually have significant roles and actually make a roster where they're playing uh, game in and game out. Now, um, that seems to be trending towards a little bit more of a positive number. But, you know, this year, you really can't use this year uh, to do any statistical analysis on that. So I can't really answer it beyond that. So hopefully that helped a little bit. Um, let's see what other questions we got coming in here. And let's see. A good comment here. Uh, I went to visit my uh, my son in Montana. It turned into a family vacation. Went to Big Sky and did Yellowstone Safari, but it was cold. Hey, that's great. Hey, we, let's, let's go back and do what we normally do and say hi to some people. Hey, Rick's on. I don't know Rick's on, but he invited Tim to come on too. Uh, my cousin Jeannie from Flint's on, as usual. Uh, we've got Perry on from Long Island. Uh, Patrick's on up in Toronto. Uh, Gary in Philly. Uh, we got Leanne in Minnesota. We've got uh, a lot of Facebook. We remember some of the different uh, sources we pull this feed to or, or push this feed to. It only shows up as Facebook. So, uh, like you, like I say, I can't really see everybody there. Uh, Tim in uh, Kansas City's on, uh, and we've got Rod on, and uh, we've got Springfield Mass on. We got a lot of people on, uh, but you know, really, this was about tonight. Just doing the video, showing you the ranks. I'm going to post that video as a separate piece on YouTube, and I'll also uh, post it as a separate piece on. Uh, uh, hello, Niagara. Good to see you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll post it as a separate piece on our, our uh, discussion group and our, our Facebook page, too. So we did have a winner on that. Got two things that are coming up that I want to uh, keep you aware of. Uh, the contest for you that are already watching is already open, meaning anytime you invite anybody to join our Facebook discussion group, your name gets put in for a drawing for a Howie's gift basket, uh, Howie's hockey tape gift basket. Uh, you can look back through and see some of our uh, a lot of times, a couple of the people that have won in the past are actually on the group, uh, uh, on the live discussion for the uh, for this for Sunday nights, so they can talk to you. Look, I'm playing with this thing. I got this thing in my hand, and I'm like fiddling with it. I got to get rid of that. Thing. Get out of here. Yuck. You know, I, I tried those things when I was there. I actually tried one, of, you know, a, a mud bug or a crawfish or whatever you call them. So yeah, I don't know how many of you know this, but you know, to eat the thing, you, you don't eat any of this big part of the body. What they do is you just basically, you, you rip it apart one piece like that, and you just take the little piece of the tail off like that, and you just eat that little bit of, bit of meat in the tail. So all that hunking, you know, this big-ass thing, you only get a little bit of it off there. And I tell you what, it's a lot of work for food. It's a lot of work. Uh, too much work for me. You know, I had them once. It wasn't bad tasting, but I, mean, I wasn't going to spend all night working on that. You know, you, you don't have to work when you order a hamburger. You just eat it. So, you know, anyway, okay, <laughs> besides that, two things going on. If you invite anybody to join our, our discussion group, uh, I track all that. You get put into a, uh, a drawing. You, get, you can win the tape. If you have the most invites, if you have the most invites, you will actually also win a Howie's gift basket. So we give two winners. One is a random drawing of anybody that invites uh, somebody to join our discussion group. And the one with the most invites uh, gets a Howie's uh, gift basket too. Uh, we've had phenomenal success in the past with uh, with these contests. I hope you uh, you join in. So if you're already last week and this week, if you're already on, anything you're doing counts. Even though I haven't put out the actual official uh, you know sheet saying or uh, you know the social media uh, post on this, telling everybody that the the contest is open. You guys get a head start on this. So take advantage of it. Get a few people to invite your friends, coaches. Uh, anything we can do to grow, to grow the group, keep it positive, and give good information out, I uh, sure would appreciate any help. The other thing we've got going right now is we're going to be scholarshipping two people. Uh, <laughs> if you toss it, okay. Uh, uh, if you toss that mud bug in our closest to the faceoff dot, do you win? So they do, <laughs> yeah, they do throw something out uh, on the ice in Shreveport. Uh, you know, between periods for, you know, closest to the face-off dot.
but I don't think they do it with the mud bugs. However, <laughs> the best part about it is you get you get all these guys up there, and I'm talking about you know you gotta you gotta realize this is a great crowd. You know, it's it's almost like a college crowd in Shreveport. They they have organized chants. They're all over the opposing goalie. Every time there's a goal scored against the or you know Shreveport scores a goal, they're on the goalie just like you're at a college game. Uh, they're they're organized, and when they do score, especially on the teams they don't like, they really have this rivalry with two teams that I can see now. Once again, you know this is my first year experience with uh, Shreveport, and I, and I don't know you know I know a lot of the coaches in, in the Nall. I don't know uh, Soupy very well. And I don't know his staff very well, but I can tell you this. They take these things and they grab them like this. And, you know, you got a guy with a tall boy in this hand and he's drinking, still got his, uh, still got his work boots on, you know, and uh, he just chucks that thing right at the other coach. And so the other coach, I'm surprised the other coaches don't put it up an umbrella because these things are flying like, you know, 30, 40, 50 coming at the other coach all at the same time. And so they're just pelting the other coach. They're not even throwing them at the ice. They're just you know, tossing them at the other coach. It's kind of fun. Uh, you can't get hurt. It's a, it's a piece of you know, plastic, but, you know, a lot of work for meat on these things. Anyway, um, <laughs> so the other kind, or not contest, the other scholarship we have open right now is our industry professional scholarship. We'll be posting it this week, too. Uh, this is for anybody that is in the industry that wants to move up in the industry, anybody that wants to get into the hockey industry as a coach, as a scout, as a uh, you know, is a position uh, inside of you know, front office, back office, junior hockey. Uh, this is mostly geared towards people that want to work in junior hockey. Uh, our industry professional webinar that uh, that sells online right now. I think the price is it's over fifteen hundred dollars, but less than two thousand. I don't know the price of it right now. Two, we're giving away two scholarships for this coming spring. Two people, uh, we will uh, will take the applicants. Everybody that applies for it will give two scholarships out. Uh, the last three uh, members that just graduated out of the program all placed, meaning they got jobs in the industry, were not in the industry before, and they're, they're just thrilled and excited to be uh, doing this. Some of them actually might be on. Uh, and if they are, they can put their own thoughts on this. Uh, but if you're, you want to be working in the industry and you want the scholarship, I'll post that this week. I'm going to ask you to uh, to just write me an email and uh, jcolson at gmail.com. Send me uh, an email. Tell me why you uh, should be the person. And uh, I'll be glad to uh, put you in with the, the other list of people that are applying for the spot. So it's an industry certification course. It'll take you a few months to get through it. It's not easy. Um, it's a lot of uh, work. It's a lot of, uh, uh, it, it's a little bit of elbow grease. But when you come out of it, you will know the the industry, uh, at least from the book, smart, the book smart side of it. You know, always, you know, experience always helps in actually getting out there and meeting people and teaching you how to meet the right people as part of the process too. And we'll get into that. So um, anyway, that's it. Any more questions coming in? Uh, I'd love to see them. Well, I'll stay on here for a second. Uh, nice to see you here, Dawson. Is a very uh, good player. Uh, I'm not sure what that one was meant to. Uh, I'm not sure who Dawson is. Well, if you, anybody wants to put a, a comment on that, that's fine. Uh, yes, uh, the the uh, the mud bugs are kind of like rubber uh, rubber pucks, uh, but they're plastic crawfish or mud bugs or whatever they are. So, hey, listen. Uh, any questions? Anybody wants to throw anything on, please do. But we'll we'll call it a night if not. And uh, frozen four predictions. Uh, look, I lost a lot of sleep last night. That Minnesota Duluth game kept me up. I fell asleep twice and woke back up twice in the game. I got a chance to watch the end and uh, I enjoyed it. But boy, oh boy, you know, I I don't really like to even try to predict. Uh, you know, clearly it was very disappointing to see the University of Michigan not be able to play because of COVID. And, uh, and get knocked out that way. Uh, you know, it happened to two teams, and it's very unfortunate uh, that, you know, th th this is the way it happened. Uh, and it's also unfortunate that they didn't have some kind of backup plan in place where another team could have been ready. I guess it wouldn't have been fair if, uh, yeah, yeah. But I just, this whole thing, this whole year is kind of bizarre. But it, Frozen Four predictions, I really don't have one. Uh, I, I, I enjoy, I'm more of a fan at that college level. Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I know a lot of the players. 
I've coached some of these players. I've uh, recruited some of these players, but you know, I don't follow close enough to really give you a, 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 any kind of educated opinion on that, or even an enthusiastic team uh, that I'm backing. I really just think it's incredible to watch the amount of skill that's out there with those guys. Uh, you, you know, the best thing. You know, I'll tell you the the most fun I had this week, just to kind of give you an insight, is, you know, on the friend side of Facebook, I've got like five thousand of you that are are friends with me, uh, or follow me. So I get a lot of feeds there. We get our discussion group. We've got our regular Facebook page. Then, then I've got these other groups I belong to. It is unbelievable to just watch the the amount of pride and the amount of happiness that hockey brings people as these seasons come to an end. And it could be a squirt season. It could be a, a high school senior season. It could be a college season. But you know, watching people that win that's great. I mean, it's really fun to see. A picture of a, a kid at no matter what age hoisting up a trophy with his teammates and having fun. Uh, I can tell you though, it just just means as just as much to me to see those pictures of people saying, you know, hey, we had a great year and we learned a lot and, and we had a lot of fun this year and we're going to come back stronger next year. But it's just fun. This last two weeks, this last week especially, seeing all these different posts about the seasons coming to an end. Um, hey, we actually got through a year. We. <laughs> We, we made it, and that, that to me is extremely, uh, just incredibly, makes me happy to know that we made it through a season. Now, not all of us. I mean, the, the USHL is still going on. The North American Hockey League is still going on. NCDC, I believe, is still going on. we still got a ways to go on things. Uh, but um, <laughs> we, we got through it. So, okay, looks like we got a question. Let's throw this up here. Uh, hey, Jeff, how much – how much is the Frazier Cup and or the top prospects scouted uh, this uh, coming April? Um, Frazier Cup, limited uh, top prospects, more so. Uh, but remember, and, and I've been trying to explain this for a while, the numbers of scouts at events has gone down drastically over the last few years. The credibility of the coaches and the teams in these events is escalated at the same time. So you might not see the same amount of coaches coming or you may not see a coach stay around for four or five days or three or four days like they used to. Coaches might come in and be very selective on events and just watch them. Uh, you'll see lower end junior coaches at these events. You'll see a lot of tier three junior coaches at these events. You'll see some uh, uh, other coaches too. But that's not the purpose, though. The purpose is to make sure that you've got a great coach and that coach is actually showcasing you in his own way. Because I'll give you a, I'll give you a for example. I'm coaching a couple of years ago, Chowder Cup or the pre-draft. It was a, one of the Boston events. And I've got two different U18 teams, so I'm hustling back and forth between the two teams that, I, that I'm actually coaching and running at the time. You know, I'm on the bench with one team. I get off the bench. I get up and get a, a cup of coffee and a sandwich in the coaches area in the, the scouting room. They, almost every one of these events. Vince has a coach in his scouting room. While I'm up there, I talk to probably five or six coaches. They go, hey, tell me what you got. Tell me what ages. I'm looking for this. I'm looking for that. You know, who do you have that fits? And because most of these guys knew me or knew, you know, about my team or my, you know, my way of looking at the game and there was a level of respect there, you know, I'm able to throw them three or four names. I'm able to give them some phone numbers and some, you know, phone numbers to text or some emails for parents right on the spot. So I'm sitting up there. I'm giving out all this information. Half of those coaches don't even go and watch our game because they're going to go find a game that they don't know anything about. Now, they might come back and circle around, but they reached out to most of those players anyway. And, hey, how you doing? I'd like to get to know you. And then if there's a relationship built, they'll come back and follow up and watch them later in the spring or summer, or they'll catch them later in the weekend. But, yes, uh, a lot of good things can happen just without being there with a good coach. And as a parent, that sponge effect, getting up there, shaking hands, hanging out by the the, uh, the snack bar for coffee, you know, uh, sitting within earshot. And I hate to say this, but, you know, as a parent, I'm always sitting three or four rows behind and to the side of wherever the scouts are sitting. I'm not trying to sit in their lap. I'm not trying to get close to them. And I'm trying to see – what they're looking at. I'm trying to see where their heads are at. Are they watching the bench? Are they watching the ice? Are they watching goalies? Are they watching D? You know, are they taking notes on left wings? Are they taking notes on right wings? Are they looking at one team and only one team? Are they there for one or two players? And you can tell if they're there for one or two players, 
when one player's on the ice, their eyes are locked on the ice. As soon as that player's done, they might write a few, write a few notes, and they're talking to their buddy, and they're, they're checking their, their phone. So you can tell what they're there for and you know what they're doing uh, by the way they go about things. So uh, I hope that helped a little bit about that question there. Uh, one last comment that came up, and then I also want to get on to the cliches real quick, and then we'll be done for the night. Uh, the, the one thing that came up, and I'm going to have – uh, Jeff Nygaard is a part of, he's the director, uh, the directing editor or the editor over at Junior Hockey Podcast. Um, and uh, what they do over there is mostly they've got a young bunch of young coaches that sit around and talk hockey. And they, they it's more of an um, entertainment source, except for Jeff. Uh, Jeff used to be the, uh, the commissioner for the NCDC. Jeff used to be the commissioner for the EHL. Um, and he, his editorial work is extremely good and his research is extremely good. Him and I always compare notes. We do things a little bit differently on how we go about uh, you know, tracking players at the D1 and the D3 level. Uh, but there's only two people that I know uh, out there that completely track D1 and D3 and thoroughly track players at that level. And it's Jeff and I. I may have Jeff on the show, but some things came up about the BCHL. Um, and some, so there was a lot of conversation about the BCHL and where it fits. Then some conversation came up about a ranking, the social media ranking that one of the advisors put out. Now, that advisor happens to be a part of this audience quite a bit. That advisor happens to be a part of our discussion group. He happens to be a friend. Um, so I, I get it. I, I get why, why he puts out a list like that, but he put out a list of the top 20 junior leagues. Now, I don't republish that because it does no good to do that. Uh, the list is heavily biased, and when, when Jeff Nygaard and I get on there, I'll, I'll explain how bias works in this because you can have multiple layers of bias when you're looking at players, when you're looking at judging teams, and especially you can have regional bias when you're trying to put together leagues and league coverage. Um, this is a very biased league towards Western Canadian players, Western Canadian leagues, Western Canadian uh, potential business. So you, you see some junior B leagues that are listed. They would absolutely never get listed by anybody else outside of that, that market. And there's nothing wrong with those leagues, except they're just not leagues that are development leagues for the, the, the basis, you know, the, the, the across the board. So when you see things posted, when you see rankings of teams, when you see rankings of junior leagues, you got to make sure you go to the facts and you got to go back to what you can build and develop off of. How do you build and develop and understand how these work? You look at production. You look at either D1 production or D3 production. And what do you mean by production? How many players do they actually produce to the next level? So one of the arguments that was made on this was where they were ranking some things and they ranked the NCDC extremely high and they ranked a couple of the tier three, tier three leagues extremely low. And there's some uneducated guesses going on about these leagues because uh, they either have had some success, some success of placing players in a couple of leagues, then, they, then there's speculation that comes involved. And that's really what it is, is speculating versus the facts. The fact is the NCDC, no matter how powerful a couple of the teams are in there, fresh commitments coming out of the NCDC tend to be just barely double digits every year. Yes, 8 to 12, right in that range. This year, same thing. Even with a couple of the kids that have jumped over to them from the uh, prep leagues because they had nowhere else to go, the number is going to be low of fresh commits because remember those prep kids, even though they're extremely high level and they're committed, they came in with commitment in hand. So you as a parent, you as a parent really could care less about the commitment in hand kid because that doesn't tell you anything about the coach or the program as far as how they develop players to the next level. There's a perfect example of that in one of the leagues right now. There's one of the teams that actually has a whole team full of uh, 10, 11, 12, maybe 14 uh, Division I commitments on the team. Okay, that, that doesn't matter if it doesn't have three or four or five of the other kids that are picking up new, fresh commitments as the season goes on. So part of this process is learning how to look at a league and say, okay, that's great. That team has, and I'll, you know, hey, look, I know Toby very well. Uh, the New Jersey, New Jersey Hitmans are a phenomenal team. They can skate with any team in the nation. I say this all the time. They are a great hockey team. However, as far as fresh commitments, a kid walking in 
at the beginning of the year with no D1 commitment and walking out, they're no better than anybody else in their league. Okay, but they have 10, 12 D1 commitments on their team at any time. They just don't happen to be kids that are committing, you know, year in and year out. They'll get their couple. They'll, don't get me wrong. They'll get their couple, and they'll lead the they'll lead lead the NCDC or be in the top two or three teams inside the NCDC as far as commitments. However, that doesn't really mean that, that anything good's going on there as far as being above and beyond. And what I mean by that is, is you can see all these statistics. You can see all these people saying how great the NCDC is. And once again, top two, three teams can play with anybody. Look at the amount of production. Back into the number and look at the amount of production the league has. You don't believe me? All you have to do is go to College Hockey Inc. Pull up College Hockey Inc. Now remember, the numbers float in that, and I'll explain what float means in a second. College Hockey Inc. will tell you where kids currently are now and what teams are playing on that are, that are committed. So if a kid committed to the uh, University of Michigan from prep school, um, it will show him whatever current junior team he's on. It floats to the next team. So it doesn't give you true information on that. So when you look at it and it says, this kid, this kid, this kid, this kid are committed, uh, and the, these kids are all with the New Jersey Hitmen, you've got to back into that and go, okay, what day did they commit? And then you see when they committed, they, they committed in 2018 when they were playing prep. They committed in 2019 when they were playing U16. So the number of commitments that are fresh, what has happened since August? And, you know, and I'm picking on New Jersey. Once again, they're a great team. There's nothing wrong with it. They can play with anybody. USHL, BCHL, North American Hockey League, that team is good. If you don't believe me, all you got to do is go back a couple years ago when they played the national team. And they lost a heartbreaker. This is back when they were an EGHL franchise, probably four or five years ago. And they lost a heartbreaker two to one to the U18 team when the U18 team, uh, national team, was stacked. And everybody thought that they were going to get their clocks cleaned. Then three two or two one, it was a one goal game. And uh, they had a chance to win the game. They had a chance to win it numerous times. But uh, the, the thought process is that you know you you. <laughs> These leagues are good because they've got good teams that have got a lot of commitments. Throw that out the window. Look at production. Look at how many fresh kids. If you come in with zero commitments on the team and you walk out with five, that's better than starting the year with 10 commitments and walking out with 11. Does that make sense to you? I hope it does. I hope that uh, that helps a little bit there. Okay, uh, comment coming in. Interesting listening to you. Thanks for doing what you do someplace for Shattuck. Uh, very good. Uh, very good. Uh, good luck to Austin. Uh, don't know if the year's up, uh, done with Shattuck right now. Uh, for those that you don't know, it's an iconic program. It's where Sidney Crosby went uh, in Minnesota, a beautiful campus. And uh, am I right? Uh, yeah, I've been to Shattuck, but am I right? Did, did Mighty Ducks, at least uh, like Mighty Ducks 2 or 3, get filmed at Shattuck? When they all went to prep school, did they use Shattuck as the, uh, the rink? Yeah, that, that'd, be a, that'd be a good one to, to know. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. So anyway, everybody have a great night. I think I covered everything. Uh, I'm going to leave the tender question for next time. Uh, I did not get the tender. Uh, yes, uh, the the uh, Shattuck rink or, uh, was used for uh, Mighty Ducks. Glad somebody jumped on and gave me that answer. I'm going to leave tenders for next week. I hope you enjoyed a little bit. Please invite some friends, win some Howie's Hockey gift baskets. Uh, if you're interested in the... Uh, the scholarship for industry professionals. Make sure you email me at J Colson. There's my name's right there. J Colson at gmail.com. Tell me why uh, you deserved it to have a, a scholarship for the program. And uh, then we'll go on. And uh, next week we'll get rolling into some other stuff too. Let me know what topics you want to talk about. Uh, have a great week in hockey. And uh, everybody, find a new rink to go, talk, uh, go visit, take some pictures of it, and send me some pictures. I'd love to see what you come up with. Everybody have a great night. Thanks for being a part of this. And I'm going to say good night. Now, now listen, I want all of our friends and family to share this on Instagram and TikTok.